let me welcome uh, everybody to today's talk. So we are going to be talking about fertility implications of family-based regularizations. Our speaker today is uh, Catalina Modo Dorantes. I was trying to find out what was the secret of her uh, amazing productivity, both in terms of quality and quantity of papers. I counted uh, nine working papers only last year, which for me is uh, uh, truly a, a great feat uh, in these uh, conditions. It we are not on... if it's the stock or, or a flow, uh, Jesus. Yeah, we, we have both here, uh, flow and stock. Together with Catalina, we have uh, her co-authors, Cristina and Noelia, uh, who, as usual, will be answering your questions uh, as uh, we go along in the Q&A uh, section. Please use that if you have some clarifying questions. Some of the questions we will post them during the presentation if we feel they belong there. And some other questions, we'll leave them for the end. So the, the presentation is going to run for 45 minutes and we will have a Q&A open uh, question sessions at, at the end with 15 more minutes. So this is all for the introduction and for housekeeping. I leave you in the expert hands of uh, Catalina. Please uh, go ahead. All right. So thank you, everybody, for the invitation to present this joint work with Cristina Borra, uh, Universidad de Sevilla, Noelia Rivera Garrido. Universidad Loyola Andalucía, they are both at the seminar as well. So if you have any questions um, throughout the seminar, please feel free to include them in the chat. So this paper, like the title says, uh, really is looking at the fertility implications of a family-based regularization program. So um, the motivation really comes uh, from the fact that um, from a couple of things. First, there's the magnitude of undocumented immigration. And in the EU, there's about 603 country nationals that were found to be legally present in 2017. About 7% of those were in Spain. And of course, this figure hugely understates the number of unauthorized migrants because it is just capturing people who were apprehended. In Spain, if you, for example, take the local population registers and subtract from that the number of valid residency permits, and you can estimate about 300,000 irregular immigrants. So just to give you a flavor of basically what has been the evolution of that number in the past 10 years, basically it has dropped significantly from about 600,000 to basically 300,000. Nevertheless, even though it has been dropping, irregular uh, immigration and in general immigration is still considered one of the main three issues that concerns Spaniards. And there is also concern coming from the fact that even in recent work documents a clear association between the inflows of less educated migrants and also a broad shift towards nationalistic parties. So uh, there are concerns that the inflow of immigrants also is having some political consequences. On the other hand, something that concerned to us with regards to this policy were differences in fertility between immigrants and natives. And we know that those are very pronounced in Europe, gross birth rates of the immigrant population were about 16 newborns per 1,000 in 2017, and that compared to nine births per 1,000 among natives. And in Spain, too, this difference was very substantial. They pretty much doubled for migrants. And this table you can hardly see because it's a lot of countries. I tried to highlight Spain, but basically what I wanted to show here is just basically, as you can see that there has been a reduction overall in the gross birth rates, both for nationals and immigrants, but it's still the ones of immigrants, those gross birth rates double the ones for natives. And of course, there are benefits and costs to these differences in immigration in fertility rates. On the one hand, uh, one can argue that they can be very helpful in sustaining social security systems, particularly in societies with an aging population. But also, there are also concerns that they can pose or be viewed as a threat to national identity. So basically, what we wanted in this paper is really to understand how immigrant fertility responds to policymaking. And in particular, focus on this family-based regularization program and how basically the specific design of immigration policies can affect immigrant fertility. So again, purpose is to examine what the fertility impact of this family-based regularization policy that granted unauthorized migrants temporary legal status based on the nationality of their children had on 
their fertility behavior. So basically, um, the idea comes from a 2011 royal decree that allowed undocumented parents to become legal residents if they were nationals from certain origins and had a Spanish-born child under the age of 18. And even though the main purpose of the policy at its time uh, was really to protect these children and keep families intact and together, it may have also unintentionally induced eligible migrants to have children. So this is basically what we want to examine. So just to give you a flavor of what we find at the end, but really we do find that uh, the decree raised fertility among eligible migrant women by 11.5 percentage points. That is a very large increase, it's about 48%. Overall, in terms of the fertility rate nationwide, it's a very small increase because this is a small share of women. So it's only 0.4% increase. The impacts stem primarily from fertility increases that are occurring among women that have are in a relationship and who were already in Spain prior to the royal decree enactment. So it's not necessarily the result of a call effect. The impacts uh, importantly appear to be driven by women's willingness to qualify for the temporary legal status and not necessarily by income effects that may be stemming from legalization and higher earnings that accompany legalization. So just to uh, also motivate a so little bit. Yes. Excuse me. So sorry for uh, making yeah. sure I understand. So the, the, this was announced in 2011, and, and you show that it's not that when this was announced, new mothers started having children for the first time, but that mothers who were already eligible because they had a child in Spain decided to have more children, a second or third child. No, in fact, no. that's a very good point, Hillel. So that's one of the things that we check in order to understand the mechanisms. And what we observe is that mothers who already had a child that was born in Spain were not having more kids. Okay, okay. So, so this, they, it, it, it must be that it. the child was born in Spain. So that's yes. The, okay, yes. That's very important. Yes, yes, okay. yes. So those who already had a child but not born in Spain made a second child? Yes. And yes. those who had already one child born in Spain did not? Did not. Okay, mm -hmm. and you have some, I guess, RDD design to, to identify this. So we have a different in difference design. We also do triple differences. And uh, we do a number of robustness checks. So, but you'll see, basically, it is getting at, at basically your point. Yes. So we start to distinguish between who had a child, who didn't have a child, prior with uh, the 2011 reform and... This is the way that basically we are able to distinguish what is the like explanation. Sorry okay. to, to continue on this. So you have the date of birth of the children, I, I guess, right? So you uh, know... We don't have, we have the age of the, ch uh, the age of the children. Yes. Yeah. No, so it me reminds me of these studies, you know, on uh, in utero, yeah. as, I mean, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, whether people, the women were pregnant, before moving, and so the, the, the child was born, yeah, but conceived uh, abroad, and so on. So anyway, we'll see what, what you do. Yeah, 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 yeah. So we have the age of the children, and we have the arrival year to Spain of the mother, too. Um, so we play with that, as well as the eligibility for the program. So they have to be from certain countries. Could I please uh, ask another question? Yes. Yes, so I was wondering uh, to understand the mechanism. Yes. What are the pathways from temporary legal migration to more permanent migration? And is it the case that if you are temporarily in Spain, you you are more likely to stay permanently than if you are illegal? I mean, it's also linked to the enforcement of the... So let me get to actually the background and, uh, and talk a little bit about citizenship, how it's regulated and the permits. And then I think that some of these questions might actually become a little bit clearer. So basically just to basically place the study. So, so far, I mean, there, there is of course a literature that has looked at the impacts of amnesties and regularization on a number of outcomes. And focusing on fertility, there is also a literature that has looked at the impact of immigration policies, sometimes uh, in changes in birth rights citizenship, other times um, as a result of immigration enforcement. 
And of course, there's also a literature that looks at the impact of non-immigration policies on fertility outcomes. And here it's very extensive. So tax incentives, child subsidies, parental leaves, cash transfers, and so on. Okay, so this study could fit more into basically examining what the fertility implications of an immigration policy are. All right, so I'm just gonna skip quickly to this. I mean, I care just to understand the fertility behavior and responsiveness to incentives, and also the differential impacts of regularization and amnesties based on their specific design. And also because this type of household actually appears to have been rising. So if you look um, at the years prior to 2011, the share of non-European women with the Spanish children was rising. All right, so let me just get first to the institutional context and say a couple of things so as to place basically what is the sample that we have and who we are comparing and so on. So basically, just to remind everybody, children born in Spain from immigrant parents are not necessarily Spanish. So Spain actually grants the nationality based on the principle of Jews and Guinea. So regardless of the place of birth, a child is Spanish if at least one of the parents is Spanish. So for, my, for example, my kids were born in San Diego, but they are Spaniards. And uh, in some instances, uh, nevertheless, the civil code in the Article 17 allows for the principle of use solely. So this is the birthright citizenship to be applied. And these are those instances in which the parents are from countries that do not grant nationality to the children, or if parents are stateless. So as to avoid the statelessness, the civil code in that case will grant those kids the Spanish nationality. And in some rare cases, citizenship can also be obtained after one year of continued legal residence, but this process only applies to children whose parents are both legal residents. So they have to be legally in the country. All right, so basically, Prior to the 2011 Royal Decree, there was a different one, the 2004 Royal Decree. And that Royal Decree had recognized three channels for gaining temporary legal status for people who were undocumented or unauthorized in the country. So one was the labor settlement channel. So this required for these individuals to have lived in Spain for two years and have worked there for one year. There was the social settlement channel that required having lived in Spain for three years, having a future one-year labor contract, and a positive report of having developed social links, and that also had to be somewhat documented. And the last one, which is really the one that was extended by the 2011 Royal Decree, was the family settlement. And this family settlement, what it did is that it granted temporary legal status to uh, non-nationals whose parents were originally Spanish, but lost the nationality, or had gained it through the historical memory law. So this was a law that basically allowed you to gain Spanish citizenship if, for example, your grandparents were Spanish. So the Royal Decree of 2011, what it did is that it, it extended the last criterion. And in particular, what it tried to do is that it modified the requirements for temporary legal status among some non-EU nationals. And the ones that really were included there were the ones from this civil code, the Article 17 civil code. So the aim of the royal decree was to promote orderly migration flows and avoid irregularity. And what it did is that the status was granted was temporary. It could be very easily adjusted to permanent after five years of continued residence. And the groups that were targeted were the, the groups basically that were already included in basically the, the Article 17. All right, okay, so, uh, so the first thing, of course, is whether this regularization channel was used at all by these migrants. And one way of looking at this descriptive wise is to look at the number of applications and concessions of family settlement between 2006 and 2014 are the ones being shown here. And you can see that there was a very large spike and increase in both of them, actually in both applications and concessions in 2011. And of course, if it only could have been in 2011, or even 2011 and 2012, one would have thought that these were mothers who already had a child born prior to the royal decree, and they simply qualified. But what you can see is that you see it continue in the years thereafter. So the idea, again, what we want to, the, I guess that the assumption is that really this, 
the, the possibility of gaining temporary legal status comes along with two things. One is that it's gonna allow you to access better paying jobs. And the second one is also potentially various forms of public assistance, whether it's social assistance or unemployment insurance if you become unemployed. And importantly, to permanent resident status after five years and eventually citizenship. And so this access to temporary legal status literally translates into a lower per unit price of having this first child born in Spain. And so through this channel, it might alter migrant fertility. So um, we formalized this hypothesis just using a standard vicarian framework. And basically what we assume is that parents are deriving utility from the number of kids and the consumption of other commodities and subject to a budget constraint. And basically the enactment of this royal decree lowers the unit price of having the first child. And at that point, all right, so basically, as I was saying, the model is very simple. It's just a utility maximization model subject to a simple budget constraint. And, and so what we assume is that a change in the cost of having that first Spanish child is going to bring about like a price effect or substitution effect and an income effect. And the price effect or substitution effect is going to be basically affecting the opportunity cost of having that first child. And as it decreases, the likelihood of having the first child will rise. And the income effect, it's basically raising purchasing power through access to better jobs and assistance programs upon legalization. And here is where we can see different things happening. So one could see, for example, if children, if, uh, for example, if children are considered normal goods, an income effect might actually increase purchasing power and might actually operate in the same direction of this price effect of raising fertility. So this could be one possibility. It could also be the case that they work in opposite directions because families are faced with this quality quantity trade-off and just choose to increase the expenditures per child. And this could have an ambiguous effect on fertility. And finally, of course, it could be the case that migrants are simply uninformed about the royal decree, or they might have actually misunderstood what were the conditions for acquiring a Spanish nationality eventually or temporary status. Yes, go ahead. Lydia. My microphone is not working. So if if the policy allows migrants to get better jobs, then the opportunity cost of having an additional kid may go up, right? So how do you do so this could go in the opposite? I'm a bit lost now because I was changing the settings, but uh, which are the implications of this better this access to better jobs for 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 fertility? Right. So basically the policy did not, yes. So and that is true. I mean, basically, we're just assuming a simple utility function that depends on the number of kids and other goods or commodities. You can also do it on the basis of leisure, which is what you're thinking. And so you could have N, C, and L, and basically have leisure there. And then basically, there's basically three things that you are trying to maximize as well. I think that that's what you're thinking of, right? In terms of hours of work, just well, I'm, I'm thinking of the, time. I mean, the the effect you find, uh, whether it's a mixture of, of all these things, right? And, and you whether... could arrive, you could have, you would arrive. We also considered that actually earlier on. So we had that discussion, and then we just settled with a simpler model, because basically you arrive to the same things at the end. So okay. you could actually have them going in the different directions. So we just basically settled for something easier. But we actually refer to that in the paper, actually, to add that possibility as well. So you could actually moderate also as a function of leisure as well, and then consider, you know, the opportunity cost of your time. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And so basically, again, the methodology that we start with is very simple. It's just a simple different day framework. We're just considering a sample composed of migrants. Again, like all the studies, we don't have information on legal status. So basically, our treatment group are migrants from countries that are eligible for the status adjustment under the royal decree, and that's basically the set of countries. And then, of course, you might have legal migrants in that group, in which case, basically, it's just going to bias the policy impact downwards, okay? And the control group are going to be EU residents who are clearly legal. They are also immigrants. We actually do not use the EU15 so that they are closer. Those characteristics are closer to the ones of migrants in the treatment group. So we use actually from the new accession countries. And I will show you the stats in a second. 
Okay, so that's basically the sample. Our outcome is gonna be having a Spanish child. We're also gonna be consider other related outcomes in the robustness checks that I will show you. Ideally, one would like to model the likelihood of having a child in Spain in any given year. But the problem is that the incidence of yearly births, if you use a survey like the labor force server that we're using, and I'll get to that why, is rather low. Okay, so even though I'll show you the results also using this outcome so that you can see that, in fact, it, it is very much, it goes in the same direction, it's actually the incidence is very low. And so an alternative that, you know, of course comes to mind firsthand is, oh, okay, one can use the Spanish vital statistics. The problem is that there you only have data on mothers, not non-mothers. And so you cannot model the likelihood of having a birth. Um, and even if you collapse them at the aggregate data, you would still miss data on the year of arrival by nationality, which is crucial in order to identify those who might have likely legalized through prior amnesties. Um, so for that reason, we use the labor force survey. And since the higher probability of having a baby in any given year should also increase the probability of having a Spanish-born child, we use that as the alternative outcome. So the model is just really a straightforward. It's just a simple diff and diff initially. And so uh, the first outcome that we model is this uh, likelihood of having a child born in Spain. And basically the post is gonna be equals to one from 2012 onward. Eligible equals one for women who are nationals from one of the countries included in the Royal Decree. We control for age, years in Spain, marital status, the number of children, tertiary education, and job tenure. And of course, we include all the fixed effects for the uh, nationality, province year, and then we also play with province year fixed effects as well as province time trends. So just to say a couple more things about the data, we use data from the second quarters of the Spanish Labor Force Survey. And this is a survey that collects data on 65,000 families in Spain, so about 160,000 individuals each trimester. And the nice thing of the EPA is that it has detailed information on the household, including the year of arrival, okay, and the composition of the household. And of course, mothers and not mothers. <laughs> so uh, we focus on the period spanning from 2007 through 2016, and this is actually to circumvent changes in the legal status of new European um, uh, migrants, so Bulgarians and Romanians, as they enter in the EU in 2007. And the sample are migrant women in fertility ages 16 to 45. We make two exclusions. One are students who are most likely legal residents, because that is a requirement to obtain a non-compulsory education. And also we exclude arrivals prior to 2005. So that basically these individuals would have been most likely legal through the 2005 regularization. And this is just a first look at just the descriptives. And you can see there in the panel A, you have basically different fertility outcomes. And in the panel B, some basic controls. And for the treatment and the control group before and after uh, the royal decree. And in general, the control variables display similar values for both groups prior to 2011. And the ones that differ, of course, are basically the fertility. You can see that the fertility is much higher for the treatment group in general than for uh, the control group. But um, when you look actually at the trends, the trends prior to 2011 were very similar. These women had high fertility levels, but their fertility was trending similarly to those of um, the group in the, um, the women in the control group. So they start to differ after 2011. And finally, the other one thing that I like to note is because of the sample construction, so our sample goes from arrivals after 2005, you can see that years, of course, in Spain are going to be rising for everybody. So this is just a simple diff and diff at the descriptive level, so just to see what is going on when we don't control for much. So you can see, again, that for women in the treatment group, we see this increase in fertility of about 21 percentage points. For those in the control group, it's about 11 percentage points, ending with a 10 percentage points difference between the two groups. And this is similar, of course, to what we get just with a simple diff and diff, when we add the additional controls, as well as uh, the province year fix effects. Basically, we end up with the royal decree raising these eligible migrant women's 
propensity to have a Spanish child by about 11.5 percentage points. That's about 48% increase. Again, this impact actually is quite reasonable when you compare it to the impact of one-time incentives of other things, of other policies. And in fact, it didn't translate to much of an increase nationwide because this is a relatively small group of women. So it ends up raising nationwide fertility only by 0.4%. This, I wanted to show you what happens if we, instead of modeling and the likelihood of having a Spanish child, you were to model the likelihood of having a baby in Spain in any given year using the labor force survey. And as I was saying earlier, basically the problem with this is that the incidence of birth is rather small. So you can see there is 0.028, okay? Uh, but again, you can see the same idea. So it's even a larger impact increase here would be like in the range of 60%, okay? And it's just basically the incidence of birth is very small if you just focus on any one year. We conduct a number of robustness checks. So first we start with really simple like placebo policies in the year prior. And again, you don't see anything really going on other than in that year of the policy. We then do like a simple pre-trend focusing on the years prior to uh, the Royal Decree and we don't see much going on. We conduct an event study and we also can see that there's really no joint significant of in the years prior, but there is in the years after. And then we also look at whether there are simple changes in the sample composition. This is unlikely to be the case because of the way the sample is constructed, which is limiting basically between 2005 and 2011 arrivals. But, and again, we don't see much. It's just basically a marginal significance in university education, but nothing else. Um, and again, if you were to look at if it's changing by countries of origin, you don't see much going on either, which is why probably you don't see anything going on in terms of changes in sample composition prior. Uh, we do a number of robustness checks that are very important given how the policy was designed. So we first start making changes to control groups. So first we start experimenting with changing the control group to include actually all EU migrants, so not necessarily from the new accession countries. And you can see that the increase in the fertility is very similar. If we include, um, if we actually focus on Spanish natives, you actually see that the same idea, a little bit larger, um, but basically eight percentage points increase in that same direction. We also actually focus on having a control group that are women from the same nationalities as those from the treatment group, but basically comparing those who already had a Spanish child prior to 2011 and clearly qualified. I think that this is what Hillel you had in mind, and then to those who did not. Okay, and you can see here that the fertility rises by nine percentage points even when you do that. Then we start playing with the treatment group. And um, in the treatment group, uh, we consider the possibility that migrants from other nationalities that were not necessarily the ones included in the Royal Decree might have mistakenly understood or that they might qualify and maybe they responded to the policy as well. So if we do that, we basically continue to find very similar impacts. We also consider restricting the sample to just new parents. And the reason for that is because one might reasonably think that the childbearing incentives might be different, okay? And, and basically there too, we also see a nine percentage point increase. What else? Um, we actually exclude likely legal migrants from the treatment group. And what we mean by this is basically excluding women who were, for example, married to a Spaniard so they can easily have access to basically legal status those who had a parent who was originally Spanish or those born in Spain and residing there for three years prior to adulthood, all of those are gonna have a very easy access to basically legal status. So we experiment with excluding those women from the treatment group. And we continue to find a large increase of about 11 percentage points. We also experiment with excluding migrants who might have qualified for temporary legal status through the labor settlement. So one of the things of the labor settlement is that if you had actually 10 years greater than six months, you could actually qualify for that. So we exclude those legal migrants from the group and basically uh, we continue to find 11 percentage points increase. And one of the last things that we do, it's, let me move this here, it's basically focus on, on women whose partners are not 
from one of the qualifying countries. So they may have had actually an even greater incentive to have a child in order for both of them to acquire legal status. And we find a 15 percentage point increase there, slightly larger. And finally, we also experiment with restricting the sample to 2009 and 2014. And basically- Catalina, I'm just, sorry. Uh, I'm Can sorry. Can I ask you a question about the, the last thing that you said? Yes. So if the partner of the woman is from a non-eligible country, this yes. means that the child is gonna get his citizenship, right? The citizenship of the father. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the decree does not apply. Well, or it only depends on the mother. No, 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 no. It, it can be any of the parents. It can be any of the parents. Okay, it doesn't have to be through the mother. Okay, okay, got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the last check is basically just playing with Bulgarians and Romanians that joined in the EU in 2007, but um, they actually require a special work permit until 2013. So what we do is that we experiment with um, basically limiting the sample to 2009 to 2014. So this is a period where they were clearly, basically they, before they were clearly authorized to work, so they still needed the permit. And you still see this 10 percentage point increase. So basically the idea here is just basically playing with different changes to the control and treatment group. We also look at whether any one country appears to be driving defects in that sample, and we don't really find much evidence of that being the case. And um, we also experimented with different alternative uh, fertility outcomes. So in the first in columns two and three, you can see there um, basically the likelihood of having a child born in Spain that is less than five years old, less than three years old. So very similar increases. And then we also look at overall the number of children. So basically, regardless of the outcome that you look, it's very, very consistent. Then uh, what we do is that we actually try to learn a little bit about who uh, might have been the women driving these impacts. And, and uh, what we can see, one of the things that we were concerned about is whether for some reason this resulted in some sort of a call effect. And so basically having women that come to Spain to have a child after the royal decree. And basically uh, what we find is that, no, that, that doesn't appear to be the case. These were women who were already in the country by 2011. And then the other one, uh, just from a policy making point of view is the concern of whether you're having single mothers having kids as opposed to women in relationships. We don't see necessarily that being the case either. And Basically, um, just to uh, wrap it up, basically, we wanted to look at, understand a little bit better the mechanisms. And so, like uh, we were discussing previously, I mean, one of the mechanisms could be a simple income effect. You could think of basically legalization, allowing you to get better jobs, higher earnings, access to programs. And basically, this income effect is the one that results in an increased number of children, or if it's really just the incentive to qualify. And so for that, what we do is that we first look at this likelihood of having a second child. And we don't see necessarily that rising in a significant manner, okay? And so this actually points towards perhaps the fact not being really the byproduct of higher income after legalization, but really just probably this incentive to qualify. And, um, and so basically we try to gauge a little bit what might have been the impact of a another legalization program on fertility. So if it's just about legalization, legalization is legalization. They should raise income in both ways. So we should see fertility increases in both. And so we try to model the fertility increases after the 2005 royal, uh, after the 2005 uh, regularization, and we don't see a similar effect on fertility. Okay, so basically, again, this suggests that it probably wasn't just an income effect stemming from higher incomes through legalization. And finally, we also experiment with a triple difference. So basically what we look is we compare basically women who from eligible nationalities who did not have a Spanish born child prior to 2011 to those who did. Okay, and you can see that the fact is stemming really from the women who did not have a Spanish born child prior to 2011. So again, this again points to this incentive to qualify for legal status. 
So that's it. So, so we study the fertility implications of the royal decree of, uh, enacted in 2011 that granted temporary legal status to undocumented parents of a Spanish-born child. And basically, we find effects that are relatively large, around 48%, even though the contribution to the overall fertility rate is, remains small and modest. The impacts do not seem to be driven by any single nationality or by recent arrivals responding to a call effect. And it seems to be uh, the response of women in relationships as opposed to single mothers. And it seems also to be the case that it's uh, really the interest to qualify for this temporary legal status um, that is driving the observed impact as opposed to income effects from legalization. Um, so that's, that's it. <laughs> So I'm not sure, yeah, I mean, we could look at, we could do some sort of, yeah, I mean, we could check in terms of uh, years of residence. They both groups, both groups seem to be increasing the residency in Spain through the same number of years in both samples in treatment and control. So um, when, when you look at, actually, let me see if I can go back to the descriptives because I think we might see it there. So here in the descriptives, you can see for both treatment and control group, the years of residency are actually rising similarly. So it doesn't seem to be the case. I mean, at the aggregate level, one group is necessarily leading to a greater degree uh, Spain than the other. Um, yeah. But I mean, we could, um, I'm trying to think uh, what one could do. Um, I mean, we do restrict already the, the sample to people who arrived after 2005 and before 2011. I, I guess it will depend a lot on the nationality, on their ability to come back to, uh, to Spain yeah. later on. Or, uh, mm -hmm. So, so I yeah. don't know, maybe you can check in an alternative data source uh, whether you have heterogeneous effects depending on uh, the nationalities that left more often the country. Yeah, yeah, we could do that. I mean. Yeah, that, that we can do. I mean, it doesn't seem that the effects are driven by any one nationality, hinting on that, but I mean, and when you look at this, like uh, this table, for example, you look at the origins before and after by country in both treatment and control, and you don't see huge differences. It's not, but I mean, we could definitely play with some of them. I mean, you know, there's always the issue of how small the sample gets there, but yeah. I mean, I think you, you do, uh, sorry to, to jump in, but I think you do address a little bit this question on when you put the characteristics as dependent variable, right? And mm -hmm. uh, checking whether they change or not uh, systematically with the policy change, right? And mm -hmm. I mean, you, you went a little bit, so I don't remember <laughs> all the results, but <laughs> I, I think you had like four characteristics Yes. Uh, I mean, the, the bit of a concern is that all the point estimates, as, as far as I remember, were negative, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, which may suggest that there is a little bit, but uh, uh, it doesn't seem that it's uh, huge. Yeah. But that was my impression on, uh, because I also had this same thought than, than Jesus, but when you showed the table, mm -hmm. I thought that it, it might be a concern, but not, not huge, uh, at least based on what I remember okay. from, from that paper. No, I mean, and that is a reasonable concern whenever you are trying to gauge the impact of an immigration policy, the sample composition is changing. And so that was the idea, first of all, of this table by country of origin and also the prior one. So to see, really, I mean, do we yeah, see- Yeah, this, this one, this one. That exactly. is changing a whole lot. And it doesn't seem like- And it seems from the- from, to me. Sorry, it seems from the summary stats, table that you showed that these numbers are, are changing based. because the control yeah. group is changing. Yeah, yeah. So here, I think that this is the Yeah, so if, if you look here, at, for example, university education, right, what's changing is the control, the pre-post mm -hmm. in the control group. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so, I mean. Yeah. It's not, yeah. I mean, not, we. Not really, that I know I much, think, but. Yeah, that is a fair concern. And I know, but I mean, we didn't see anything like really glaring that there is a change in the composition. And I think part of that, because we're restricting it already quite a bit in terms of when they enter and when they were there. But uh, yeah, but that's a good point. Martin, but you, you had a question? We look at a couple of nationalities. Uh, go ahead, Simone. 
No, there was a question from Martin Fernandez. Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Catarina. Yeah. You show a picture that I thought was very interesting, and it was yes. about the share of petitions that were approved over time. And oh, it's yeah, yeah, there yeah. were some, a, some yeah. sort of like constraints or bureaucracy to do yeah, with this the one. So I was thinking whether migrants have the certainty that they would get the regularization for sure, or that this process of waiting actually could have an influence on their fertility decisions, and whether there was variation across the space in how they dealt with all these petitions, and if you could explore this, right? So the fact that actually I'm waiting for so long that maybe, I don't know, like, I have children later or on the opposite, right? Maybe I want to make pressure on the process and I have a baby because I think that this may help me to speed up the process. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, actually, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard to tell. I mean, here, basically what you can see is that definitely people were aware of the policy, I guess. That's the first thing that one can see that the applications went up a lot. It seems probably that in the first year, there may not have been a good understanding of what were the qualifying the characteristics. And so that probably led to a very large increase in applications and less than half were actually approved. And then you see basically more approvals thereafter. Um, so um, yeah, I mean, to me, this graph, the most that I was reading into this graph was a couple of two things. First, if the policy had bite, and the second one, if the bite occurred just in one or two years after, or actually it also occurred in other years. And so whether it is a fact that women already had a Spanish born child and they just basically learn about the policy and applied, or basically whether they responded to the policy. Uh, so yes. did you look a little bit at, uh, uh, you mentioned before the, the changes in the, one of the robustness was dealing with the Romanians and Bulgarians uh, sí. because of the entry in, in 2007. And I sí. remember that there was also a change in the status of Romanians in 2009. 2009 uh, did you see yeah. anything? So we did actually, we restricted it. And I mean, we could play with that too. Um, uh, let me see that I get to it. So I think it's the last one there. So I think it's this one. Okay, so basically in this column 10. So yeah, so basically there what we did is that we were thinking, okay, so, you know, they really needed a special work permit until 2013. So maybe they were not really in the same category. So if what happens if we just restrict the sample to that period? To before they were clearly authorized to work. And we just didn't see much of a difference. I mean, the, the effect remains very, very, you know, very similar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you were saying, Jesus, to try what? No, no, I, I was uh, uh, wondering whether there was an, any difference between dropping uh, Romanians, where I remember there was this change in the, in the possibility that they would have to work in Spain, because first okay. they were allowed and then they were denied. So mm -hmm. including or not including Romanians, but I think Romanians, okay. Romanians are, is yeah, going to be can... most of the group here and anyway, so it's going to be basically yeah. what you are finding here already. Yeah, no, we could definitely try that one, yeah, for sure. Okay, so thanks a lot for adjusting so well to time so that we have yeah, time to, no, to discuss the, during, the, during the presentation. And uh, thanks to all the participants and uh, to all of you for listening. And uh, we hope to uh, have you back here uh, next week for the next seminar presentation. Simone, please, do you want to make the announcement? So it's going to be a, a paper by Michel Bain, one of the organizers with, uh, with Frédéric Doquier and Michel Bierler. So see you online next week. Bye. Right. Okay, bye. Bye, thank you.